England and Germany are two of the latest teams to name their squads for the Qatar World Cup, set to kick off in 10 days' time. All 32 teams have until Monday, that's November 14, next Monday, to name their playing party. For England, the big question heading into the announcement was whether manager Gareth Southgate would name Leicester City playmaker James Madison in his squad. Madison and Newcastle striker Callum Wilson, both of whom played, well, last played for the Three Lions in 2019, made the cut. Just before we move further, not so long ago, Callum Wilson was being eyed by the reggae boys. Um, yeah, and he, he ignored the overtures, so, you know. He was proven right. You know, the reggae boys are England and the World Cup. There you go. Meanwhile, the favorite player of the Boo Boys, Harry Maguire, was also included, along with Chelsea's Conor Gallagher, who won the first of his four international caps in November last year. So this is what the full England squad looks like. I know there are many, many England fans in the Caribbean. I can't understand how or why. The keepers, Pickford, Ramsdale, and Pope. The defenders, Trippier, Alexander-Arnold, Walker. White, that's Ben White from Arsenal. Maguire, Stones, Dyer, Connor Cody. He's now at Everton, the man who forged the career at Wolves. Luke Shaw is there as well. Midfielders, Rice, Bellingham, Phillips, Henderson, Connor Gallagher, and Mason Mount. The forwards, Kane, Wilson, Rashford, Sterling, Saka, Foden, Grealish, and Madison. Now, at his press conference earlier today, Southgate was asked about his team's capacity to win the World Cup. We've wanted to make sure we've got the balance of the squad right. Um, I think in this day and age, squad is more important than ever. We've, we're now five substitutes. You can have almost half the team changed during a game. So you want different options for different moments of, t of matches um, and for different stages of the tournament as well. Um, we've obviously had to cover a couple of players that aren't yet fully fit, fully match fit as well, so having 26 available meant that we were probably able to take a couple of risks that you might not have been able to with 23. Um, but we think the balance is there and we've got cover in the, the positions we need. We're, we're lighter on depth in some positions than other in, in our country, um, but we think we've got everything covered. Joining us to evaluate the England squad is our international football correspondent, our favourite Englishman here at Sportsmax, Simon Evans. Simon, good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon, George. Excellent. All right. Let's start with the inclusion of James Madison. Southgate said he possesses something a little bit different from his midfielders. What is that something? Well, he does. He's somebody who can play in that number 10 position and really be a proper link between midfield and attack, but much more focused on the attack. His, his midfield is, is quite workmanlike in, in most positions, so he does give that bit of flair. Also excellent at set pieces. Um, and, you know, he's not been somebody... You never got the impression that Southgate really was convinced about him. But I think the key there when he's saying about you've got 26 men... You know, you can take him, you can throw him on in a group stage game for the last 15, 20 minutes, and if he does something, he's a bonus. I don't, I don't expect to see him. I'd be surprised if in that first starting 11, it, it features James Madison, though. A player who has been talked about a lot, especially given the form of Harry Maguire at centre-half, is the AC Milan centre-half, Ikaya Tomori, who was immense when they won Serie A last season, admittedly. He has not looked the part in the Champions League games we've seen him in. Not look the same player, but it's a different level, so maybe that's it. Many people are saying he ought to have been selected, especially given that Maguire's form continues, his best form continues to elude him. What say you about the Tomori omission? Yeah, I mean, the Tomori one, I think rather than compare it to Maguire, I'd maybe compare him to Conor Cody and question that one. Um, you know, Conor Cody... Uh, uh, a workman-like, solid Premier League defender. Um, you know, that's that's all you can say about him, really. Um, and, and, you know, I think Tomori can consider himself unlucky, but we've seen this so many times with England. When players go and play in different leagues than in the English leagues, they don't tend to get treated the same way. Uh, Tammy Abraham might feel the same. You know, playing for AS Roma, did very well there last year. I think probably would have gone if it had been the World Cup in the summer, as it should have been. Um, but, you know, hasn't had a great start to the season in Serie A. So, you know, I, I, think, I think there is still that thing there with England. If you're not in the shop window all the time in the Premier League, you, you do get much less of a chance. 
Yeah, the, the selection of Callum Wilson, well, well, I, I must tell you that Callum Wilson is a player I really, really like. I thought that if this guy had the luck with fitness that, or with injuries that, uh, the, that, that so many have had over time, he would have been without doubt one of the top strikers in the Premier League. He still is one of the top strikers in the Premier League, yeah. notwithstanding the fleeting appearances that he makes because of injuries. His selection and the exclusion of Ivan Tony, who, was, who has a lot of admirers, and then his profile a little bit different to much of what England has up front, assess for me the omission of Tony and the selection of Callum Wilson. Yeah, it's a difficult one, that, because I, I really like Tony, and I think he, 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 he can do so much, and he, he's, he's much more of a, of, a, of a target figure as well. Um, but England don't play that kind of football with a target man, even though they've got Harry Kane there. Callum Wilson, is he a better bet for coming off that bench with 20 minutes to go when Kane's tired and maybe sneaking into the back post and scoring a Gary Lineker type goal? I think he probably is. So I can see, I can see the logic in that one. And you're right, Wilson, the reason why the big clubs haven't gone and signed him is he doesn't have that durability. Every season he's picking up injuries, but that doesn't matter for a World Cup. He's got to keep fit for four or five weeks and, and do the business when he's called upon. So I can, I can totally see the logic in, in, in Callum Wilson. Big gamble or small gamble? The, the, the selection of Calvin Phillips, palpably not match fit yet. Uh, there are 10 days to the World Cup. Southgate said today that, look, if we play the seven games at the World Cup, and a seven would be mean that they're, they're, they're in the final, he won't be able to play 90 minutes in any of those games. So we're going to have to build him up and then work with him. To gamble on a player who you are certain, even in that first game, won't be able to give you 90 minutes and you've made that gamble now. Was that the wisest decision that Southgate and his enablers could have made? No, I think it speaks more to the, the lack of quality in that position for England. Um, I really do. Because the player who's probably missed out as a result of that is James Ward-Prowse, who is uh, a different kind of player, not anywhere near as strong physically or as uh, effective defensively. Brilliant at set pieces, um, and that would have been an asset that you might have thought about as well. Again, thinking about with those five subs in the last 15, 20 minutes of games where we start to see more and more this become part of football. Who do you finish with? Who are your finishers? But I think Calvin Phillips is a, is a really questionable one that he hasn't really featured at all much at all this season for Manchester City. Uh, that injury he picked up in the summer has stuck with him, and uh. Yeah, I mean, he's a kind of player who, if you're going to feature him, you're going to play him from the start. So, you know, he'd be somebody who would be in there with Rice. That's been the pairing. So he's got to hope that, uh, you know, he's got other options there in Henderson. Um, but he's got to hope that uh, that Phillips can, can give him something. Um, but I, I do question that one. Yeah, a, a couple more for you. The, there was a time this season when it looked as if Dean Henderson would have thrown down a strong challenge to the established order in Southgate's goalkeeping ranks with Nottingham Forest. Has Dean Henderson, you think, paid for the poor form of Nottingham Forest this season by not being selected for this World Cup trip? Um, possibly. Um, I don't think he's, he's done enough to, to really, um, you know, capture, you know, and force himself into into that position, really. I think Nick Pope, he had a disappointing uh, game in the last uh, round of Nation League's games, um, but I think he's a pretty solid uh, backup option there. But, but ultimately, nothing is going to shift Southgate away from Pickford. Even when Jordan Pickford's had bad runs of form with Everton, Southgate always picks him. He always says, he's never let me down for England. I'm not worried about what he does week in, week out with Everton. It's what he does with England that matters. So I think in the goalkeeper spot, uh, Pickford was always number one, and I think uh, Henderson was battling really to be uh, number three. Simon, England were beaten semi-finalists four years ago in, in Russia. Is this squad, as you see it, equipped to match or even better what we saw four years ago? Possibly. I think there's a good start in 11 in there. Um, I, I think if you look through that 26-man squad, there's a lot of questions you can ask about various players. You, you mentioned Harry Maguire earlier, George. You can, you can question Luke Shaw. You can question uh, uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold based on his form for Liverpool and so on. You can go through that team and sort of say, well, how are they in the squad? Or what's Conor Cody doing there? And so on and so forth. But I think there is a good 11 there. And if you can get a good 11 and effective use of substitutes, they can go far. If they, if they get a little bit of luck on the way. Are they better than four years ago? Possibly, but not as much as many people had hoped. I think the feeling was, 
in Russia that this was a young team that was progressing and developing and was going to be at its peak when it came to Qatar. And that hasn't really happened. Yeah, here's the thing I have, Simon, with the squad. Uh, well, nobody knows what will happen. Yeah, if we did, we'd, we'd be making, we'd be set to make a lot of money of the, of the bookies because we'd bet what we know would happen. When I look at the England squad, and I'd appreciate if I could get the graphic again, Mr. Producer. When I look at the England squad and compare it to teams that have won the World Cup in the past, and there's an E word that is misused, abused so often, the word, of, the, the, the word experience. When I look at the squad, Simon, I'm going to lead an experience, but from the perspective of experience winning big trophies. None of the goalkeepers have done so. Of the defenders, Alexander Arnold, a Premier League winner and a Champions League winner. Uh, John Stones, a Premier League winner. Midfield, okay. in the midfield, Jordan Henderson, a Premier League and a Champions League winner. Uh, Mason Mount, a Champions League winner. Up front, Sterling has won the Premier League a, a couple of times. Foden has won the Premier League. Jack Grealish is now a Premier League winner. The fact is, Simon, and, 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 and I say fact, not opinion, the teams that have won the World Cup, even if those boys together have never won the World Cup before, those squads are usually dripping with men who've won the biggest domestic leagues in Europe and multiple Champions League winners. If you look at the, the last French squad, you'll see what I mean. If you look at the Germany squad before that, you'll see what I mean. If you look at the Italy squad from years ago, you'll see what I mean. If you go back to 2002, 20 years, and look at the Brazil squad, those are some of the players with the biggest club reputations in world football. I'm looking at this England squad. And in terms of star quality at club level, where those boys have lifted their clubs to higher level, meaning that they have the potential to lift their nations to higher, le higher levels, it is thin in that regard, Simon. It is. It is. When you compare it, you know, you're talking about those teams in the past. You look at the Italy ones, they always had that core of Juventus and AC Milan players who were winning Champions League and winning Serie A. And you're absolutely right that... That core and that spine, and, and, and England have had it in the past, you know, when they, what they talk about the golden generation with, you know, uh, Gerard and Lampard and, and, and that era of players, um, you, you, where you did have that, from, particularly drawn from Manchester United and Liverpool. That isn't there. And uh, it comes down to really, I think, uh, whether or not Southgate still has this ability to turn England into a club team. He managed to do that in the past, which no other managers have really done it very well. I have a lot of criticism of Southgate tactically, but in terms of his man and management and his creation of a, of a team spirit, he's been very good at that. I wonder after these Nation League games where you saw England a little bit falling back into their old ways, whether that's been lost a little bit, but we'll find out very soon. Yeah, let's look at the German squad quickly. Uh, the head coach Hansi Flick has gambled on the young Borussia Dortmund uh, striker. And he has named him in his squad at just 17 years old. Let's look at them. So Neuer, Ter Stegen, Trafli goalkeepers, a lot of experience there and quality. Ginter, Rudiger, Sula, Schlotterbeck, Kerrer, Raum, Klosterman, Bella Kochap, the man from Southampton, who's emerged this season, a breakout season for him. Christian Gunter as well. Gunderhan, Hoffman, Goretzka, Gnabry, Sane, Musiala, Kimmich, Muller, Brandt. Gutza, and then up front, Havertz, Mokoko, the youngster at 17 years old, Fulkrug, uh, a, a man who has been doing very well in the Bundesliga this season, and Karim Adeyemi. This squad, does it have the... Well, let's look at it. Uh, let's talk about that after. But the German, the Belgium, uh, Courtois, Mignoli and Castiles, Vertonghen, Alderweireld, Voutfeis, Teta, De Bast, Mounier, Castagne, De Bruyne, Tielemans, Onana, Witzel, Vanneken, Dendonker, Carrasco, Torgan, Hazard, Eden Hazard, the Catalier, Charles, uh, Leandro Trossard, the man lighting up the EPL for, 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 for Brighton, uh, Mertens, Doku, Lukaku, Batshuayi, and Openda, uh, the men for Roberto Martinez. Let's start with the Belgians uh, first. Uh, well, let's start with the Germans first. We look at their graphic first. <laughs> Marco Reus, I don't know. He's missed three of the last four big tournaments for Germany, and he's just cursed. He's not in there. Do you get the sense that the absence of Reus was what convinced Flick that he needed a player like Mario Götze in the squad this time? Yeah, I do think that was it. Yeah, I mean, to bring Götze back after, I think it's five years since he last played for, for the German national team, raised a lot of eyebrows, but I think he was looking at it, and going back to what you said about experience, and experience in World Cups and big positions, 
uh, Goethe has that in, in abundance. So that one makes sense. And then you throw in the, the 17 year old, um, you know, those, those can work both ways, but actually very, very rarely do they come off. You know, the famous one in England was, was when Sven Goran Eriksson took uh, Theo yeah, Walcott Cup, to yeah. a World Cup. But we've seen it as well with players in the past when Brazil took Kaká and then he didn't play at all. You know, it, it, this, this seem like the kind of decisions that are made for, hey, this guy's going to be great in four years' time. Let's give him some experience and a taste of it now. Yep. The issue is when you look at that German squad, um, I'm sure, Simon, you are a, 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 a man who has seen uh, several summers, a few World Cups, I'm sure, more than a few. I, in my shorter lifetime, have never, before last World Cup, seen a German squad where the forward line, the strikers, didn't have a, the strikers line didn't have a killer. This forward line for Germany does not have a killer either. And I'm not yet used, Simon, used to a German side, not having a striker who you can put your pot on the fire, you can bet your house that if they get a chance, they will score. And I think therein lies Hansi Flick's problem. Yeah, I think so. Although, you know, we've seen Germany come into tournaments there where, you know, in the past where you look at it and you say, well, who've they got up front? Well, they've got Klose. Well, he's not that good anymore. You know, Miroslav Klose, he's getting on a bit. And then he goes and becomes a record but, but at least, But at least he had a back, but at least he had the back class of scoring many international goals. That's the point yeah, I'm making. Yeah, absolutely. But it didn't seem like, uh, going into the World Cup, they didn't seem like top class strikers. But Germany creates opportunities uh, for, for people. And you look at that midfield. You know, there's a lot of quality and strength in that midfield. You know, maybe the defence isn't as strong as it's been in the past. Uh, no Hummels there. Um, and up front, like you say, they're, they're missing some experienced quality, an out-and-out goal scorer. But the midfield is full of quality there. And I think, you know, you look at those players like uh, Gundogan and Cruz and so on, they're, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna create opportunities and they're going to be able to dominate games as well. So... And a lot of people don't rate Germany for this World Cup and, and think that they're, they're, they're still in the doldrums a little bit. I'm not so sure. And I like Flick as well as a manager. He's shown in the past that he can get the best out of teams and, and make a quick impact. So I, I, I still very reluctant to, to bet against Germany getting into the final stages of this tournament. Yeah, Simon, people who know me for decades know that I'm a German fan from Karl Heinz Rummenigge in 1982. Oh, that but, was what? But, but to, to build on the point that George just made, I remember watching Russia 2018, which was hugely disappointing, of course, for German fans, and, and saying that I think, I think Thomas Muller doesn't have any more to offer at this stage. A little surprising for me, even though he's been okay for Bayern Munich, a little surprising to me that four years on from Russia, when he was ineffective, he is still there commanding a spot. And um, I think that by itself sort of underlines some of the issues that Germany has offensively. Yeah, although Germany has always done this with players, haven't they? I mean, you know, Lothar Matthäus was playing until he was like 37 or 38, I think, in his last World Cup. Mm -hmm. they, they do stick by people, um, and, and Muller has that, that ability. You know, it comes down to these little moments. We're only talking about five or six games, and, and little moments that in a quarterfinal can make the difference. And, and someone like Thomas Muller, who, who just has that now and that ability to time his runs perfectly, and, and we've seen it. We've seen it in the Champions League plenty of times where you know he seemed to be having a quiet game, and then suddenly he just arrives in the penalty area at, at the right time. And for a team that doesn't have that great attacking threat. To have someone like him coming from deeper positions yeah. uh, could be invaluable. Yeah, Joachim Love didn't have a spot for Leroy Sané in Russia 2018. Of course, he is there now commanding his spot. How influential do you think he might be for the Germans? Yeah, well, he's influential in, in a couple of ways. One is a great escape ball. You know, if you're under pressure in, in a game, especially in a, in a knockout tie, uh, and you want to get on the counter-attack, he's superb for that. Um, and then, of course, you know, he can provide surprises in and around the penalty area. He, he blows hot and cold, doesn't he? We've seen, we saw it at Manchester City and we've seen it uh, with the German national team as well. But he's had a good spell of form with Bayern and I think, uh, I think it could be a good tournament for him. Yeah, fantastic athlete, Leroy Sade. He's quickly on the Belgium squad. Uh, the golden generation, Simon, of uh, Hazard and uh, De Bruyne and Lukaku and Dries Mertens and everybody. Thibaut Courtois is now the olden generation. Belgium come with a squad that I think has passed its peak in terms of its potential. Do you agree with that narrative? I do really, yeah. And it's, it's a pity because they've been a good team to watch, haven't they, over the years. I mean, 
could they go through and, 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 and win a couple of knockout stage games and get to the semis or, or something like that? It's not beyond the realms of possibility, but they're not the, the, the exciting team that, are, that you feel could, you know, their time has come anymore. Like you say, it feels like their time has, has passed them by a little bit. Hear you on that. Thank you very much for your analysis and your work. Simon, all the best to you. We'll be talking again. All right, we'll do. Cheers. Simon Evans there uh, talking to us, our favorite guy uh, from uh, the UK. He's based in Florida now and continuing to do great work recovering uh, sport, not just football. He's a man of many talents, Simon, very talents in the media world. We take a break. We'll be back with more after these.